It's, uh, it's good to be here. I, as, as a guy that, that runs the 4-H youth program, uh, I was able to be here all afternoon and to hear some of the concerns and, and some of the issues and challenges that you have in front of you is certainly uh, great for me to hear because what, what I try to do is take all the things that you do here and make it make sense to young people. And I say I, uh, I really mean we. There's a, a ton of us that do that, of how we do that. And so I, I was listening, obviously, to a lot of the speakers and took some notes because I wanted to try to equate it to, you know, wh where I fit and, and where the youth organizations fit. But Chad, is Chad still here? Yeah, I, I, I use this Lincoln quote all the time. And I, because of you, I, I went and made sure it was accurate, you know, and so uh, based on some of your slides. But, but I think this, to me, resonates a lot of, of what we're talking about here. And, and it is a Lincoln quote. And it's the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of the government in the next. And I think about that a lot as I think about the 4-H youth program, which in Texas is 600,000 strong. We reach a ton of kids. We teach them a lot about agriculture. Uh, some of them in urban areas, as has already been mentioned, in even rural areas, they're, they're clueless on, on where things come from. So this is a challenge we have all the time. And so I, I'll talk some about that. I'm also, in, in addition to running the 4-H program, I, I have... I do a lot of leadership work with organizations working together, how they best work together. And I thought about that a lot as, uh, as I was asked to come and give this presentation. So I'm also going to tie some things together with, with how we need to think as a system uh, and then move forward. But, but I find myself a lot in this job running across the country uh, apologizing uh, for today's young people. I, just, I find myself doing that a lot, and I hear this all the time. All, all this technology is making us antisocial. And then I post this, right? L last night, I, I had to run an errand to HEB, and I couldn't help but notice as I was in line, uh, the five people behind me, the five people behind me with their carts were all on their phones looking at something. And, and sometimes I think when we criticize young people, we have to think about our own behaviors, because I, I know I have the tendency to do the same. And so I want us to think about young people as, as you know, th this generation and how we utilize some of the things that they know better than us as digital natives and how that's going to fit into our world as we move forward. And, you know, all these kids, all they do is take selfies. And here's a picture from 1920, right? <laughs> right? The one advantage young people have over us in the room, or one of the advantages, I should say, is, is everything, I don't know if it's an advantage, it's a characteristic, is a more appropriate term. The difference between 1920s and today is real time. And that's the real difference. Uh, this took a while to process. Uh, you used to have to take it to a place called Kodak. Do you remember those? Sometimes I think about from our own ag sector, are, are we Kodak in some of the things we do? Are, are we going to be relevant, right, as an ag guy? Uh, and a third generation educator, I, I think about that a lot. And then all these kids they do is play video games. We used to put a quarter in a lot of these, right? So sure, things change, things are different, and somewhere in a, in a galaxy far, far away, this technology just may make R2-D2 jump right out of his robot gear and eat a hot dog, right? By the way, most kids think Star Wars never started in 1977 when the first movie came out. They only know the last three. It's disappointing to me, but oh well. I do think about that a lot, and it's not just technology. I mean, we used to smoke on airplanes. We're living in a world today where 50% of our population lives in these counties in blue. And so in Texas alone, I think it's right at 50% within those counties right there. I think 66% in the top you know, 25, 30 counties, whatever that number is. We're further and further removed from the farms we've ever been. And, and I have to tell you this, and this breaks my heart to tell you, uh, but even the kids that we work in from a rural aspect in our state, uh, and they come in and they have a strong ag background, uh, you, can, you probably can predict this, but a lot of them at home are being told, don't come back here. Right? Don't come back to the farm, go, go do something else. And I think those are real challenges for us. And I think agriculture from a family farm, and I heard some of that today, that the farms are getting smaller, the bigger ones are getting bigger, and, and so forth. And so, so all of this being said, man, there's lots of changes out there. There's lots of things that change. All these things change, and, and that includes water, energy, and, and nexus, and why we're here. And so, you know, one of the things I want to talk about is talk about young people is, you know, that's not apologize uh, for who, who you are, 
but not stop thinking about who we could be either because we can't get comfortable with the status quo. So in all actuality, today's youth are this. What the research says, and I, you know, also, you know, you, you can read Vitas or whatever. I'm also chair of the statewide youth development initiative, which brings together youth organizations from across the state to talk about these kinds of things and to do some research, kind of figure out what kids are doing today and, and where they need help or whatever. They're more worldly than any of us were when they were kids. When we were kids, what I mean by that, they understand the world more. They un we didn't really know what, what the Middle East was. We didn't know uh, about different religions and cultures. And so they're, they're more, they see more of that. They also have you know, news that's on 24 hours a day on multiple channels that we didn't have. We, we waited for Cronkite to tell us what happened in the day. Right? So they, they are more, more worldly. Uh, they care more about their environment. This particular generation is really into service and, and the environment. And as I heard some of the conversations going around here, I think those are things that we have to consider as we move forward. Uh, they're interested in making a difference. Again, they're, they're very service-oriented. And as I've already said, they're, they're real timers. Uh, they want things immediately. That's sometimes good and sometimes bad. And so as you read through those, you're like, man, man these are, this is a good generation. But let me be clear. Right? They ain't perfect. Uh, they like to question the status quo. They may be impatient. They spend more time in front of a screen. Uh, they exercise less. They don't care about cooking because they can go anywhere and get their meals. And they use their earphones a lot. Typically, it's when you as a parent is trying to talk to them. Right? But I'd also argue a lot of these, when we were their age, we did the same thing. We, we you know, we, we questioned the status quo. We were probably impatient. We wanted to get out and... Uh, do different things. We just did it with mullets, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's always the guys with no hair that think that's funny. But uh, in, in saying that, that that's, that's the youth that we have. And so the question is, is how do we in this room take advantage of these attributes, both these attributes from the previous two slides? And so this is where I'll switch gears and talk a little bit about, about you know, systems and organizations and how we can take advantage of this and move forward. Because I don't know, if you're like me, and you go to a lot of conferences, it all sounds really good until you get back home and do what? Log in. And when you log in and you download all your emails, you, you, you forget about all, it gets further and further and further away from what you learned today in Austin. And matter of fact, I, uh, we're working on, on some projects right now about goals and, and, and about how we, can, how we can do that. And I'll show you that in a, in a minute. But, but it leads me to think about this concept. Because to me, this is an innovative day. This is a day of innovation. A day of innovation. And, and so as I think about innovation and, and as they ask me to come talk about how can we take advantage of young people and, and really uh, move them forward to think about innovation, Right? And to me, there's a direct line about innovation. And on top, or, or to, to one side maybe is a better way, is what we know. I heard that a lot today. I heard about where the weather's been. I heard some predictions about where it's going. I, I heard about different laws and policies and so forth. And so, so what we know is failures and successes. We know facts. We know people. We know history. We know figures. We know consistency. You know, we know, that, uh, we know what's proven. We know experience matters. And, and frankly, uh, from, from the director of the 4-H program, I, I've tried to move us out of that. Right, because I, I know we spend a lot of time talking about what we already know, and, and what that means is we don't move. And so one of the challenges I think we have here today, and as we work with, with young people and think about them as future leaders, is that the line of innovation really, let, let's talk about the, the, the seven things underneath there. How much are we promoting the willingness to try? the openness to change, the building new teams, the willingness to adapt, the, to take risks, to develop new partnerships and collaborations and, and to be open to new ideas. How much, as we think about our educational system and how we're thinking about the future, are we willing to really do this? I think those are what we try to challenge our young people a lot with different ambassador groups and, and groups that are interested in some of the things that we're talking about here. How do we get them to think that the line of innovation can be shifted? And so I want us to think about that. As you leave here today, 
How does that line of innovation shift for you to keep this dialogue going? Because if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. Right? I really love that quote because it, it, it makes you stop and think. You know, and I get criticized in my job of, well, Chris, you're too open to change. Some things we're doing, we're doing really well. Yeah, no kidding. But, but if we don't try to figure out how to make it better, then what are we doing? Right? And this is another philosophy that, that uh, we've been working on with a couple of grad students and some of the other work that I do. If, uh, and I've heard it a lot today. I've heard a lot today about how we're going to collaborate and, and how we're going to better work together. And I want to be real clear about what these terms are. Again, we're talking to a, a, a group of young, we're talking about a group of young people that I'm dealing with that, that communication is easy. I mean, communication in today's world has never been easier. But unfortunately, connecting has never been harder. And what I mean by that, on the next slide, I actually have tried to break some of these down about how true teams are successful. Right? Communicating is two-way. Communicate, speak, listen, hear, who knows what happens. We move down to cooperating, which we talk about a lot, but people get together, share information, and agree to some goals. We get to collaborating, and that's where we're finally making some tough decisions. We're deciding what to do. Does the Noble Foundation do this for us? Does so-and-so do that for us? I mean, who's going to sacrifice what to gain different things, and where are we willing to do that? The do's and the don'ts, and then adjusting our workloads. And, and you know, I, I think getting there is great, but, but if we can get to connecting where we as organizations can think about each other, their values, their mission, their beliefs, and setting strategies to meet these, then we're at a higher level. And I'll give you the example that I heard today. And I tell our young people this all the time, uh, particularly the kids that are interested, they serve as livestock and ag ambassadors for us. I, I tell them all the time, you guys spend more time complaining and griping and comparing the kids that have goat projects versus the kids that have cattle projects, while there's other people out there attacking both of you, and what you ought to do is come together and work together, because you have a heck of a lot more in common than you're willing to admit. Right, and the example I give them, because a couple of years ago as the 4-H director, I got hammered by PETA one day. I mean hammered by one of these bloggers we were talking about earlier. I mean hammered. And so I had to give our lawyers. I wanted to know what I could say, because what I first typed uh, was a good personal message, but probably not one as the director of 4-H. You know, but but when, somebody, when somebody says the 5th H stands for hate, I'll tell you, I get pretty fired up about that, right? And, and so in saying that, the example I give with the kids is, how many of you think you have something in, in, in common with PETA? And they all tell me, oh, no way, PETA, they're terrible, right? Well, actually, we have things in common. We just have different strategies. We have different beliefs, possibly, but we both think, we both value four-legged animals, right? But we're not willing to sit down and talk about it. We'd rather just fire at each other. And, and maybe those are two extremes, but when I think about what we're talking about today between environment and energy and oil and water, and let, uh, you know, uh, livestock and land, it's, it's what can we agree on to get to that connecting level, because to me that's where successful teamwork is going to happen in the future. And, and the reason it's there is because kids are more connected than ever, they communicate more than ever, right, but it's in a different way, but are they connecting from a value, from a purpose point of view? And I think those are the things, as I sit here and listen again this afternoon, those are the things that, that I'm hearing. And, and then I think you have to think a little bit about, as you leave here today, how do you work even past connecting? Because the people with the problem are the problem, and unfortunately, you're also the solution. Or actually, that's fortunately, you're part of the solution. And the truth is, it is not just goals that have to be set. There also has to be a reality check regarding focus. And I really want us to consider this and use this as a teaching method and idea for young people. And this is actually something I'm working on a, on a different project, and uh, it really came true to me because, because I, I, I was sitting, I, I, I coordinate or oversee, supervise 27 people, and every year they do a goal-setting exercise with me at Performance Review, and every year they come into Performance Review, guess what their goals are? They're the same every year. Every year, same goal. Well, Chris, I need to do more research. You've told me that. You've told me to spend more time with my family. So, okay, that's my next goal. My other goal is I need to do more virtual training and do more web design, right? And so, and so then the next year comes and they give me the same thing. And the next year they come, they give me the same thing. And I think in this room we do that. We have a meeting. 
Uh, particularly when organizations have to work together, right? We have a meeting, we come together, yep, let's go out, here's our goals, we're one voice, oh crap, here's my inbox again, or here's my, I gotta go teach this class or whatever. And so this actually came to me in Ireland when I was with uh, my wife and I on vacation last year. She said, hey, do you see that goat? And I'm looking, you know, no, I don't see the goat. She goes, well, it's over there, right? I had to focus on the goat, but when I focused on the goat, I missed everything else. Sometimes we do have to focus, though. Right? So, so here's a little exercise I want you to think about as a group. Not today, obviously, or we don't have the time to. Actually, we do because of the traffic, but we're not. <laughs> right? But all I want you to think is, as you leave here, what are your five goals with this Nexus concept? Right? What are your five goals? Where do you want to go by, by, by a year from now, or two years, or whatever you want to set your goals for? You know, I want you to think about that on your plane ride home or your drive home or whatever. What is it that we really want to get done here? And then I want you to write down what your five realities are. You know, Brent, my five realities are when the phone rings and a producer wants to talk to me about rice, I've got to be there for him, right? And when a 4-H mom comes in because Brent didn't send something to him and yell at him and then he emails me, then it's on my list, my reality list, right? Never, never, no, I'd blame you. But anyway, and then think about what your times are with your realities. Because see, what, what I think we get into trouble, particularly as we work as groups, and I think this is a strong message to young people, and something that we teach a lot about goal setting, is you can't reach your goal if your reality doesn't look like your goal. Right? And so, where do your five goals fit with this this meeting, those of you that made it to the finish line, where do your five goals fit into your five realities? So this is what I, this is something I use a lot now, e even, again, even with our young people, when they come in and they talk about where they want to go with the 4-H program and the next year based on their leadership traits or their leadership ability and what they want to do, and then they give me their five realities, and, and then we get to the end of the year and they didn't get it done because they went back to their realities. And then you can ask some of these questions. The most telling question for me when you look at some of the analysis and, and what I sit down and done with this, folks, is, is how many times what's preventing us to, pers to go where we need to go is actually us ourselves. Right? And so those are the things as we work together in groups, I, I think we really have to sit, consider. And frankly, to me, that, that's, I'm an adaptive leadership guy. That, that's the, the method that, that I use and believe. I believe all of us, me included as an animal scientist by trade, and a lot of you that were talking so far in the room with your, with, with, with your background and, and one specific thing, you, you are taught for technical change. You are taught, if I do this, this should happen. That's what my research and science background has taught me. And it's not that easy because really it's a world of adaptive change. Right? And to add more to that, here's the adaptation change model that all of us in this room, as we move forward, are going to have to consider. This is the most important slide. I know that's hard for you to believe because you've had some good ones, right? Thank you. Thank you for laughing. I appreciate that. I've got 10 minutes left. The reality is there's always going to be some discussion about the same Q&A I've heard this afternoon between feedlot fed, organic, growth hormones, no growth hormones, whatever the case may be. Th those conversations are always going to be there. And if you're going to work collective as a group, what, what you really have to decide and what we have to decide, and this is a model we use in 4-H all the time, because I get told all the time, well, Chris, you know, you, you're, you don't forget your ag roots, right, as I'm, I'm trying to figure out how 4-H fits in urban areas. So I have to think about, okay, what, what, what am I willing to conserve, right? These are the same conversations that we have to have, and we need to be teaching young people this because this will help their teamwork atmosphere as they move forward and they want to do things differently maybe than we've done them. But what are we, really, what are we in this room, what are we on this topic, what are we willing to conserve? And I think I know the answer. What you're conserving is your philosophy of we've got to feed somewhere between 7 and 11 billion people. What we're willing to conserve is we believe that ag is our future, we've got to feed the world. I mean, we have, 
values and those things that they're willing to conserve. But, but at the same time, some of us are going to have to, we're going to have to discard some of the things that we've always thought. Maybe we don't know all the right answers. Now that's tough to do, right? It's tough to discard things. But those are the conversations that we're going to have to have if we're going to add other things. If we're going to be more open to, okay, what does this mean from a laws and reg point of view compared to a research project that's happening over here, and what's the Im impact it's going to have on the environment, we're going to have to face some things ourselves, right? Right? And those are conversations that are tough. Those are tough conversations to have. I'm speaking to you as the 4-H director with, with a group of volunteers that like the 4-H program like it was in the 70s and 80s, and I'm telling them, here's where we are today. Here's what I've conserved. Here's what we've got to move on, and here's what we need to add. Those are tough, tough conversations. It reminds me of, of the, four, the lady that called me one day and said, you know, was yelling at me about some of the emphasis we put on science. And we were in 4-H together. She has kids in our program now. At the end of the conversation, she said, well, Chris, this year in the 4-H program you and I grew up in. And I said, well, thank you. <laughs> she, she didn't laugh, but I appreciate you doing that. Um, she asked for my boss. But anyway, um, th those are the things that we really do have to consider and think through. And sometimes I worry it is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's a very competitive world. We all want to win. And, and as we work with youth, and as a very competitive person, very competitive person myself, I have to think about this model and how we work with youth to sacrifice, to give and take, to get to what we really believe are our core values or really believe what we want to conserve and move forward. And, and really in this reality, I, I made this slide before we came today, uh, uh, based on, I looked at the agenda and kind of thought through it. And so this is our, so, so consider this your system that you're working in, our system. Because I'm in the system too, right? I mean, there, there could be a whole, a whole other silo or whatever cone there that says youth development, right? But, but we all have some system. This big system is us. It's all of us here today. We all work within this system. And we all work we represent some group that's on here. And so think back to the goal and reality. The reality is you're going to leave here. Some of you are going to go to the University of Georgia. Some of you are going to go back to Florida. Some of you are going to go back uh, to Texas or somewhere in Texas and, and so forth. And so you've got to figure out when you leave here in the middle, in the red circle, you've got to figure out what we're going to agree to agree to. And that's, from a nexus point of view, that's what we've got to work towards. Knowing that when you go back, you've got other things you've got to deal with, okay? That's not going to go away. But if you can stay focused on what we're working on in the middle, that's what we're working toward. But understand, but understand, we've got to be able to move these cones. Uh, there's, I, I can't make three dimensions, right, on a PowerPoint, but these are really overlapping each other. Because the water group's issue is impacting the farmer's issue. And there may be things the farmer has to sacrifice for the water group to be successful and vice versa. And again, those are the tough conversations to have in the work that we do. Because I, my secretary says every time I go over to the admin building, every time I go to the administration building, my secretary says, so this is our group here. She says, okay come back with less work and more money, right? <laughs> she, she's been the secretary there 36 years. Don't agree to do more work, Chris. Bring us back more money, right? Well, then I get inside the red circle with Travis, who's gone, but, but all the people that we work with at the assistant director, and, and, and that's the agency perspective, right? But, but some of the folks, they don't see that. They only see this. We've got to agree what we have to agree and do the work we have to do and that may come at a loss for some. And I don't think we talk enough about that. So you may be sitting there going, well, wh where does youth fit into this? Well, I, I think, I think they, they are it. I think this system right here is them. Uh, because you were once them, and they will once be you. Or they will in the future be you. And so knowing what we learned at the beginning that I talked, and the balancing of what we learned here in the middle, consider this. 
what I think you have to consider, what we have to consider collectively is what are our values? What is our working environment going to look like? What are our philosophies? What does that structure look like to work together? And then what's our culture look like? Because if we can create the right kind of atmosphere for them, it will be much easier for them to be successful in the work we're going to leave them with. Right? If we can establish the tough part, the hard work of building a culture of cross-communication and sharing values and sacrificing things for the betterment of whatever that common good is versus sometimes getting caught up in our silo, then we've created an environment that will be more successful for them. When I think about progress, I think about three quotes. In my office, if you use these three quotes, it costs you a dollar. <laughs> because I think when we think about this kind of work, this kind of work, uh, we can't look back. Matter of fact, I have a whole speech that talks about the windshield versus the rearview mirror, that we got to focus on what's in front of us. Don't worry about what's behind us. But a side note to that. Um, the other day, I backed into the garage, broke it. So I walked in and told Randy, my wife, what I did. She said, hey, you know that speech you give about the windshield? I said, yep. She said, maybe those rearview mirrors are a little more important than you think, right? <laughs> Golly, she's tough. Anyway, those were the good old days. Man, those good old days are gone. They are gone. They don't exist. If you're committed to this room and the sessions that you went through today, then you believe the better days are ahead. And if you're satisfied with the good old days, and I hear it all the time, back in the good old days, well, those days are gone. And if we find ourselves attracted to the good old days, maybe it's time for us to be a part of that good old day system. It's a small world after all. I think this generation is the most, understands that the most. Now, unfortunately, you're going to sing this song all the way home, but, but that's your problem. But, but the point is, it's, it's not a small world. And the issues that you're facing here today is about a really, really big world. And then, I know even Mr. Lawyer said it is what it is, and, and, and certainly there are times where, where it may be it is, right? But we can't be satisfied with that. Because if we were satisfied with that, we wouldn't be here today. If we were satisfied with how it is currently. So I give this speech all the time, and I had a 10-year-old 4 h ask me, well, Chris, if those, are the, if those are the sayings you don't like, what sayings do you like? So I thought I'd close with this, sayings I love, because I think this really resonates. And I wrote this before today, so I'm really happy about it. But I think it resonates with a lot of the things I heard from technologies to change to times to all those things. Times, circumstances, technologies, and even people may change, but the principles of sound leadership, they don't. Purpose, vision, caring, creativity, teamwork. All mixed together, are we willing to think different together to move forward? That's my goal with the young people I work with, that we work with collectively, is don't be satisfied with today. How do we get better? And all that is what leads to change. Change is hard work. And then finally, it's all about purpose. It's all about purpose. Purpose is so critically important, I call it the it. When somebody says, man, that person gets it, or that person doesn't get it, right? And then somebody says, well, what's it? And they're like, I don't know. I just know it's it. That's it. What we heard today and what your work is, it's about purpose. People in the ag world, people that are passionate about feeding the world, people that don't want people to, grow, to go hungry. Purpose drives all we do, and, and I think purpose will trump and win out in the end of all the other challenges that, that are placed in front of us. And saying all that, this is really hard work. You know why I know it's hard to work? Because David got a grant to do the work on it. If it wasn't hard work, they wouldn't be given money to address this, right? And if it was really easy work, it had already been done. This is tough, tough work. Uh, 
But if we're committed to purpose and we're committed to thinking maybe different and shifting our mindsets, sacrificing a little bit to gain something else, I'm convinced we can create the environment for this youth when they sit in this room to make us even more successful.